Well, good morning, brethren, and happy Sabbath to you all. Certainly, fun, certainly plenty of fun and games trying to get up here this morning. Now, today in my sermon, I'll be continuing with a series that I began recently on the major doctrines of the Bible. Now, in this message, we'll be exploring the topic of who and what God is. Now, there's quite a lot to cover in this particular subject, so I'm going to be breaking this up into two sermons. Now, covering this topic, I'm going to be breaking it up into seven sections. Now, today we'll only be covering just the first two sections, the true God versus false gods, where we will develop a working definition as to how the Bible defines what God is. And in the second section, we'll look at who Jesus Christ is and address the question of whether Jesus is the Jewish Messiah who was prophesied in the Hebrew Scriptures of the Old Testament. Now, along the way, I'll touch on and discuss a few of the controversies in relation to the nature of God. Now, mankind has had many different ideas of who and what God is. Now, here are some of the most common ideas of who and what God is. Now, in the ancient world, the dominant view was that there were many gods who controlled different functions of the universe, gods of fertility, of thunder and rain, of the sun and the sea, etc., and these guys were worshipped through carved idols man makes, which such gods are manifested through. Now in mainstream Christianity, the dominant view is that God is a trinity composed of God the Father, Jesus Christ, and a third person called the Holy Spirit. Now others believe that God is only one being who is the creator of all. Now, Jews and Muslims essentially believe this along with some Christian groups who don't believe that Jesus is divine. Now, some Christians and New Age believers view God as having no specific shape, but as in every rock and tree and everywhere in the universe. Now, in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, Solomon wrote, He has put eternity into their hearts. Now, mankind has a spiritual side that is drawn to what to know what is beyond this physical life. And religions have sprung up in an attempt to answer that question and to channel man's yearning to worship the greater forces of this world so they will help and protect it in this life. Now, before we look at who and what the true God is, let's briefly look at the different false gods worshipped in ancient times whose names crop up in the Bible. Now Israel's neighbours, the Canaanites, had a pantheon of gods. Now at the top of the Canaanite pantheon was El, who was like a less active chairman of the board, while Baal was much like a more active CEO. Now Baal's consort was Astarte, or also known as Asherah. Now these same gods had equivalents in other nations around Israel. Now Baal's equivalent was Hadad in Syria, Molech in Ammon and Chemosh in Moab. In Greece and Rome, his equivalent was Zeus or, and Jupiter in Rome. Now, likewise, Astarte had her equivalents in the ancient world, such as Isis in Egypt, Ishtar in Babylon, and Venus in Rome. Now, I've listed here and on the hand that I've given out the major gods and their equivalents. Now, from soon after they settled the land right up to the Jewish exile, the Israelites were drawn to the pagan gods of the nations around them. Now, why were they so attracted to the pagan gods? Well, there are a number of reasons for why they were drawn to them. Now, these points I'm going to cover here were, were from a great sermon by Mark Robertson in Brisbane on why Israel was attracted to paganism. Now, the ancient world was full of superstition. Now, there was both the carrot and the stick reasons for why people worshipped the pagan gods. Now, in relation to superstition and fear, the Israelites did not want to incur the wrath of what they perceived to be the local gods of the land of Canaan. Now, that was the stick. One thing that was the carrot was the free sexual immorality from the temple prostitutes that went along with the pagan worship. Now, the next three reasons on my list here are things that can actually be a problem with our relationship with the true God. Now, the first is that the Israelites wanted to see their gods. 
And the ancient peoples carved idols that they could see and allowed them to feel connected with the power behind the idol, which they could not see. Now, this is just like the elaborate images and statues in the Catholic and Orthodox churches, where they, which they feel connects them with the true God. Now, this, however, is forbidden in the second commandment. We're told to worship God in spirit, as Jesus says in John 4, verse 24. Now, this takes walking by faith in an invisible God rather than walking by sight, which is our natural human liberty. Now, this tendency was also why the Israelites eventually asked for a human king who they could, not, who, who they could see rather than relying on God for protection who they could not see. Now, the next reason is something that is called sympathetic magic, magic by historians. Now, temple prostitution was based on this idea of sympathetic magic. So by having sex with a temple prostitute, it was thought that this ritual would compel Baal and Astarte to mate in the heavens and cause fertility to come upon the land. Now, fertility was particularly important in Israel, which is a land that has few permanent rivers. Now, the most extreme example of this sympathetic magic was sacrificing their firstborn children to the gods. Now, by burning their baby sons and daughters, they felt that this ritual would compel the gods to give them whatever they wanted most. It's kind of like rubbing a genie's lamp. They thought they could get the god to give them a wish by giving up what they valued most in doing this detestable act. Now, this was a sad testament to the selfishness of the people that they were willing to sacrifice their children to get things that they lusted for. Now, today, we see the same selfishness happening with the sin of abortion, where women are sacrificing their own unborn children to avoid the inconvenience of raising them, despite the incredible demand that there is for children to be adopted. Now, we have to be careful of this attitude of sympathetic magic in our own relationship with God, where we try to compel God to do our bidding. Now, all that we have comes from God's mercy and grace. Now, we can claim God's promises, such as his promise to provide for our needs, but we should avoid having a presumptuous attitude where we demand God to give us what we ask for, as if we deserve it based on our own merits. Now, the last point on this list here is putting ritual over relationship, or put another way, putting form over substance. Now, this is the lazy and selfish approach that thinks, well, if I just do these token rituals, I will be okay with God. Now, we see this in mainstream Christianity where people feel if they do certain token rituals, such as going to Mass or church on Christmas and Easter, that they are okay with God, while they live carnal lives with no regard to God and his more the rest of the week or the rest of the year. Now, God is looking for a change of heart and a change of our ways from sin to righteousness, not token rituals. Now, battling our human nature and living our lives in harmony with his law takes hard work, even with the help and power of God. Now, all that was needed in the worship of the pagan gods were token rituals, not a change in heart and lifestyle. The form over substance was also a major problem for the Pharisees. They were strict with the letter of the law, but never focused on their hearts and attitudes. They were strict with keeping the Sabbath and holy days and tithing and other physical rituals, but they were filled with pride, envy, prejudice and greed. Now with that as background, let's now look at what the Bible has to say about who and what God is. Now a key point in differentiating the true God from all other false gods is that the true God is the creator of all. Now God is the great creator of all around us and when he rested on the Sabbath and commanded that we should rest on that day, he gave us a weekly memorial of his great creation. Now in the Christian New Testament, this point about God being the creator of all is a point used by the Apostle Paul when he's communicating with the pagan Gentiles rather than the Jews. 
Now Acts 14, Paul tells the people in Lystra, in today's nation of Turkey, to turn to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all the things that are in them. Now a few chapters later, when in Athens, Paul tells the pagan Greeks there, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Right. Now the Jews in their worship of God will quote what they refer to as the Shema, which is Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Now that verse reads the following. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now to the Jews, this statement is an assertion of the numerical oneness of God in contrast to the multiple pagan gods of other nations as we've just looked at. Now is God just one being who is creator and supreme ruler over all things? Is that the only way that we should define who the true God is? Now what we should realise if we define God that way alone is that this definition actually rules out Jesus Christ as being God. So just what do we mean by the true God being one? Well, the word translated one in Deuteronomy 6.4 is the word Yahad. Now most of the time, this word is translated as one. Now in other places though, it is also translated as first and also as alone. Now bear in mind that in the that the word before it in our English translation, the is, is one, is in italics and was added by the translators to make the translation more readable. Now the phrase, the Lord is one, could also be translated as the Lord first or the Lord alone. Now in its notes on, the, on this verse, the Companion Bible says the following, uh, Ihad equals compound unity, one made up others. And Expositor's Bible commentary also has this to say. To the Jews, verse 4 is not only an assertion of monotheism, it is also an assertion of the numerical oneness of God. Now this kind of oneness, however, runs contrary to the use of Hihad in the sense of a unity made up of several parts. So we see here that the word Hihad means a compound unity one made up of multiple parts. Now the Hebrew word for God is the word Elohim, which we first run across in Genesis 1 verse 1. Now later in that chapter we read in verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now the use of the words us and our here fits well with this idea of the oneness of God being that of compound unity. One God that is comprised of more than one member. It does not say, let me, let me make man in my image and my likeness, but it says, let us make man in our image. Now some people explain the use of the plural words us and our here by saying that God was talking with the angels. Now it should be noted that angels, for the most part, do not look like mankind. Now most have wings and most look like animals. Now there is a good case that a portion of them in their natural state do look like men, but and also all of them can transform to look like men if they choose to do so. Now in the Christian New Testament, the idea of unity to explain the oneness of God is seen in John 17 verse 11 where Jesus asked the Father to keep those that he had called one, just as he and his Father were one. Now the Hebrew word translated as God, Elohim, means mighty ones. In most cases, Elohim is translated as God, but there are a few cases where it can mean angels who are mighty beings, or as judges who stand in judgment in place of God. Now, Elohim is a plural word. Now, the telltale sign that gives that away is the I-M at the end of the word, which is the equivalent of putting an S at the end of a word in English. 
Now, when used for false gods, plural verbs are used with Elohim. However, what we find whenever it is used for the true God, that singular verbs are used instead. Now, what this means is that Elohim, when used for the true God, is a uni plural word like team or family or church. One group made up of many members. Now, an English equivalent is the national name of the United States. Now, it is plural in form. In other words, it has an S at the end of it, uh, like the I am at the end of Elohim, but singular verbs are used. For example, we do not say that the United States are at war. We say that the United States is at war. We use the singular verb is rather than the plural verb are. Now, the United States is a uniplural. Now, while it is made up of 50 states, there is one United States, not two or more United States. Now, similarly, there is one true God, one group made up of more than one member. Now, in the New Testament, in the Christian New Testament, the Greek word for God that is used is the word theos. Now, the Greek word for theos is both singular and plural, depending on the context. Now, this is very much like our English word sheep. There is one sheep, two sheep, and a flock of sheep. Similarly, there is one theos, two theos, and multiple theos. The same word is used regardless of how many there are. Now, for the Jews, they believe that there is only one being named Yahweh, or God. However, putting the New Testament aside and just using the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures, we see evidence that this is not correct. Now, in Zechariah 2, verses 8 and 9, we read the following. For thus says the Lord of hosts. So note here, who is doing the speaking is the Lord of hosts. And he goes on to say, he sent me the me here being the Lord of hosts, after glory to the nations which plumb you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoiled for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. And remember who the me is, is the Lord of hosts. So here is a being called the Yahweh of hosts, the Lord of hosts, who says, you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. So we see here two beings here called the Lord of Hosts. Now it's exactly the same Hebrew word used for both individuals. Strong's number 3068. Now in addition to Genesis 126 that we looked at before, which implies multiple beings in the Godhead by the use of plural, the plural words us and our, we have another interesting reference in Proverbs 30. And verse 4, which says, Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And notice this, what is his son's name, if you know? Now, when we get to the next section, we'll address the issue of whether Jesus really is the Jewish Messiah as claimed by the New Testament. Now, for the next two slides, we will take the New Testament at face value before we dig deeper into the Hebrew scriptures to see whether or not Jesus matches what it tells us about the Jewish Messiah. So let's now try to see how the Bible defines what God is. Now in the New Testament, in John 1, it says that the second Lord of hosts being that we just read about in Zechariah 2 and called here the Word was in the beginning with God and that he was also God. Now verse 14 goes on to say that this being called the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, like what Isaiah 9 6 says about a child being born unto us. Now John goes on to say that this being was the one who was known to history as Jesus Christ. So how could the Word be with God and also be God? Now, Mr. Herbert Armstrong used to explain it this way. Now, my name might be Smith, and I have a son named John, and he is also Smith because Smith is the family name. Similarly, God is both a name used for God the Father as well as being the family name. 
And we see here in John 1 that God is used for more than one being. So God, therefore, is also a kind of being, since the word is also God in addition to God the Father. Now let's add one more piece to our biblical definition of what God is. Now the first of the Ten Commandments is, You shall have no other gods before me. Now according to the first commandment, only the true God can be worshipped. In Revelation 4.10 we read about God the Father being worshipped in heaven. Now there's a number of examples in the New Testament where Jesus Christ is worshipped and there being no issue with God about that. Now one example is Matthew 2.11 which speaks of the wise men worshipping Jesus after his birth. In Matthew 8.2 it says that a leper worshipped Jesus and neither did Jesus tell him not to nor did he redirect his worship to the Father in heaven. In Matthew 14, 33, his disciples worshipped him after he calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And again, Jesus makes no attempt to tell them not to. And finally, in John 20, Thomas worshipped Jesus after he acknowledged him as, be as being resurrected. Now, according to the New Testament, God the Father and Jesus Christ can both be worshipped. Now, in contrast to that, we find that angels are not to be worshipped. Now, when John tries to worship an angel in Revelation 22, he is quickly told to, know, to do no such thing by the angel. Now, neither can men be worshipped. An example I've given a reference for here is Acts 14, where Paul and Barnabas at Lystra were worshipped when they were thought to be Hermes and Zeus, and Paul very quickly told them not to worship them. So, based on the first commandment and these examples, we can further refine our def biblical definition of God as being a member of the divine family, or a kind of being that can be worshipped. Okay, so let's now look further into the question of who Jesus Christ is and whether or not he was the Jewish Messiah prophesied in the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures. Now we've already seen multiple indications in the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures that speak of at least two beings called the Lord of Hosts and that the Hebrew Elohim is a union plural word indicating one God with more than one member. Now the New Testament claims that this second being called the Lord of Hosts was the Messiah who came down from heaven to give his life to pay for our sins, the person known to history as Jesus Christ. Now the Jews focus only on the prophecies about a coming king to rule all nations and make the Jews a great nation again. Now Christians believe that they miss the dual, dual role of the Messiah, first to come as a man and then die to pay the penalty for our sins, and only later to come again as a great king to rule all nations. Now the prophet Isaiah, in several chapters of his book, refocuses on someone referred to as my servant. Now those chapters are Isaiah 42, 49, 50, 52, and Isaiah 53. Now the Jews for the most part believe that the servant of the Lord in these chapters is the nation of Israel rather than a particular individual, even though they look for a great king as a coming Messiah. Now here in Isaiah 42 it says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Now it goes on to say a few verses down, I the Lord have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Now Jesus quoted verse 7 to John the Baptist's disciples when John relayed a question about whether Jesus was the Messiah or should we look for another. Now verse 6 about the Messiah being a light to the Gentiles 
was used by the apostles when emphasising that salvation was now being opened up to all nations. Now, in a May 1984 Plain Truth article, there appeared an article written by Eli Chipra called The Coming Messiah in Prophecy. Now, in that article, he wrote the following. Now, I'm going to quote it at length here. Most Christians assume that Jesus of Nazareth is God's promised Messiah. Most Jewish people assume that he is not. Few people today give the subject much thought. They simply accept what they have been taught from youth. I was brought up in Judaism. Now, since childhood, I was told that Jesus of the New Testament is not from God. I was taught that God inspired the Hebrew Scriptures, what Christians call the Old Testament, but what the Jewish people know as the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings, and that no other Scriptures are inspired. Now, I accepted without question my teachings. Then the challenge came. I read the Plain Truth magazine and found it in it valuable principles for living my day-to-day -day life. Yet, the plain truth often made reference to the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament. I glossed over these statements at first. However, the more I read, the more I realised that I could no longer ignore the question of the New Testament. Now, this was a difficult challenge. I would be delving into questions foreign to my way of thinking. I faced up to the challenge and found the answers to my questions. Now, in discussing the identity of the servant of the Lord in Isaiah, Eli Chipra goes on and writes the following. He says, God calls the people of Israel collectively his servant. That is clear. Yet later, God talks about a servant in totally different terms. Are we to assume that this also refers to Israel? Another reference to this servant is in chapter 49. Now Israel, God's servant, symbolically speaks first. Israel did not accomplish her task of being a light to the Gentiles. The other servant speaks beginning in verse 5. And now says the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel be gathered unto him. For I am honourable in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. Yes, he says... It is too light a thing that, that, that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the offspring of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the nations that my salvation may be unto the end of the earth. Now this servant cannot be Israel. He is the one who restores Israel. This is the same servant mentioned in Isaiah 42. He is to be God's salvation to the ends of the earth. Now this is a reference to the great king who will rule the earth, the Messiah. But now notice the verse that follows in chapter 49. This great king to whom God Almighty will give the rulership of the earth, he is one who is despised of men, who is abhorred by nations, a servant of rulers, verse 7. He is here called a servant of rulers. What a title for the king of all the earth. But immediately in the same verse, God says, Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves. Now clearly two events are mentioned here. One is when he is a servant, the Messiah is aboard, and the second is when he is honoured. But why is he rejected? Isaiah quotes the servant, as again speaking in chapter 50. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious, neither turned away backward. Now this servant cannot be Israel because God calls the people rebellious. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off my hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah 50 verse 6. Why would God's servant, the Messiah, allow this? For what reason is he beaten? First, notice verse 10. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant? Isaiah continues describing the servant with verse 13 of chapter 52. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. 
according as many were appalled at thee, so marred was his visage, unlike that of a man, and his form unlike that of the sons of men. So shall he startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told to them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, shall they perceive. Verses 13 and 15. He would be tragically disfigured. But how can this be? And most of all, why? The idea that the Messiah was to suffer before being glorified used to be recognised in Judaism. Several passages in the older Jewish writings, including the Talmud, speak of the Messiah suffering. With that background, I came to study Isaiah 53 again. <clears throat> the most common interpretation among the Jewish people is that this is a reference to Israel. In my study, I look further into Hebrew scriptures to find which possible explanation is meant. Isaiah says, For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due. Verse 8. My people in the Hebrew scriptures refers to Israel. The servant therefore cannot refer to Israel. This servant actually bears the pains and sins of others. He is killed even though he is righteous. This cannot be Israel. End of quote. So notice carefully in verse 6, it says, Like sheep we have all gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 8 says that he was to die, he would be cut off from the land of the living. And the reason given why he would die is for the transgression of my people, he was stricken. That is, the transgressions of God's people, Israel, he was stricken. Now this suffering servant would die to pay for mankind's sins. Now if the sacrifice of animals via the sacrificial system was sufficient as payment for our sins, then this righteous servant of the Lord would have no need to die. His prophesied death showed that something greater was needed to take away our sins. Now verses 11 and 12 again highlight that this righteous servant would give his life and bear the sins of others in the process. This again could not be the nation of Israel as Israel was much more rebellious than righteous and the nation did not give its life to pay for the sins of the Gentiles. Now Jesus Christ however did all of these things. He lived a righteous life and gave up his life willingly for us. When on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now what he was actually doing in quoting the start of this well-known psalm, Psalm 22, was doing what the Jews call a remez, which means a hint. By saying the first part of the psalm, he was encouraging his listeners to recall the rest of this psalm and how it was being fulfilled right before their eyes. Now notice verse 16 of the psalm, which says, They pierced my hands and my feet. Now this was part of his crucifixion, a particular type of death that wasn't even invented for hundreds of years after David wrote this psalm. Now in addition to giving his life and being crucified, there are many other messianic prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. Now, Jesus was born in Bethlehem as prophesied in Micah 5 verse 2. Jesus was descended from the line of David and we know from Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7 he will rule on the throne of David. Now, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey during his triumphal entry. Now, Zechariah 9 verse 9 says, Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding on a donkey. And we also know that Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver and his garments were to be parted and lots cast for them. Now Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7 talks about a child being born. So this individual will have an existence as a man and that the government would be on his shoulder and that he would sit on the throne of God forever. 
Now the term Messiah is derived from the word anointed, as kings would be anointed with oil when they were coronated. Now the Hebrew word is Mashiach, which when transliterated to Latin is the word Messiah. Now in Greek, the word for anointed is the word Christos, from which we get the name Christ from. Now in Psalm 2, David talks about the kings of the earth setting out against the Lord and his anointed, and that the anointed one will receive the nations as his inheritance. Now at the end of Matthew 22, Jesus posed a question to the Pharisees where he quotes Psalm 110 verse 1. And we read, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, How does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Now this completely stumped and silenced them. The Pharisees were correct that the Messiah would descend from David as multiple verses speak of him sitting on the throne of David. Now Jesus shows that the Messiah is David's Lord and superior. Now if he had an existence at the time of David, Jesus asked the Pharisees, well, how could he also be descended from David? Now, the only way of answering the question is by the admission that the Messiah was an immortal being as well as human, that he, he had an existence at the time of David and was his Lord and Master, and that he would also become a man that was descended from him. Now the verse says that the Lord spoke to David's Lord who is the Messiah. So God and the Messiah appear to be two immortal beings. Now this same immortal being is the one described in Daniel 7 called one like the Son of Man to whom the Ancient of Days gives an everlasting kingdom to just like in Psalm 110. Now for the Messiah to rule a kingdom forever means that he is an eternal being. So two eternal beings are being described here. The Ancient of Days, God the Father, and one like the Son of Man, the Messiah, who will eventually take over the rulership of the whole world. Now, if the Messiah is to be the one who rules the whole world directly in the future, then if we go to Zechariah 14, we see that he is clearly identified as the Lord or Yahweh. Now verse 4 says that his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, and in verse 9 it says that the Lord Yahweh shall be king of the whole earth. And when we go to the New Testament, we find that Jesus is referred to as the Son of God 46 times in the New Testament. Now the references that equate Jesus as God as opposed to the Son of God are much fewer. Now one of those is we've looked at already at the beginning of, the, of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And verse 14 then tells us, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now this of course was Jesus Christ who was God with God the Father, and was also God. Now in the book of, in, sorry, in the epistle of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, we also read, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery, uh, the word essentially means a thing to be grasped for, to be equal with, with God. Now we know from other scriptures that God was under the Father, sorry, Jesus was under the Father in authority, but he was in the form of God and equal to God in all other respects apart from the authority of the Father. Now the one other reference referring to Jesus as God is found in John 20, where it says that Jesus said to Thomas, reach your finger here 
look at my hands. And Thomas uh, said to him, my Lord and my God. Now the Greek word here is theos that we've looked at before, which does mean God. Now John 1 further tells us that Jesus Christ, as the pre-existent word, was the one through which all things and the whole universe was created. Now this would also include the angels who Jesus was the creator of. Now the plans originated with God the Father, and Jesus acted as the workman who executed the Father's plans in creating the universe. John 1.3 says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1.6 says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are that on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Now the Greek word translated through or by here is dia, which means the channel of an act. Now additionally we read in Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2, God has in these last days spoke to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Now a fourth reference to Jesus being the workman who executed God the Father's plans of creation is Ephesians 3.9 which says, God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Now we've seen in those verses that Jesus was the agent of creation, including creating all the heavenly angels. Now this brings us to the question of how Jesus differs from the angels. Now in addition to being their creator, there are three key differences, and these are discussed in the first chapter of the book of Hebrews. Now after Paul discusses those key differences, he will move into a discussion of man's incredible destiny in chapter 2, which we'll come to later. Now notice the first key difference between Jesus and the angels. And that is that Jesus is begotten of God, while the angels are only created sons of God, not begotten sons of God. Now Paul says this about Jesus, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a much more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Now the second key difference is that Jesus is an heir to inherit all things, unlike the angels, as it says in Hebrews 2 verse 5, that the world to come will not be under the authority of angels, it says. And the third key difference is that Jesus is worthy of worship, unlike the angels. Now Paul says in Hebrews 1 verse 6, but when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Now this is actually a quotation from uh, Psalm 97 verse 7, which says, Worship him, all you gods. Now gods in that verse is Elohim, which Paul, under inspiration, interprets as angels of God. Now Elohim, as we've seen before, means mighty ones, and it's not exclusive to God the Father and Jesus Christ. Now in Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9, we read how when John tries to worship an angel in Revelation 22, he's quickly told not to do any such thing, showing that angels are not to be worshipped. So notice those three differences between Jesus and the angels. One, Jesus is begotten. Two, Jesus is to inherit all things. And three, Jesus is worthy of worship. Now we're going to come back to these three key differences later when we look at the question of whether man can become God or not. Now with that as background, I'd like to briefly address a belief held by the Jehovah's Witnesses that Jesus Christ was the archangel named Michael. Now they believe Jesus is the Son of God but not God and therefore not worthy of worship. Now Michael is mentioned only five times in the Bible. 
Now the view that Michael is Jesus comes primarily from two verses. The first is Revelation 12, 7, which talks about Michael being in charge of the angels who are fighting Satan and his fallen angels. Now the other is Daniel 12, 1, which talks about Michael being the great prince who stands watch over Israel. Now there's nothing in those verses against the opposing view that Christ has overall charge like the president as commander in chief and that Michael is the general of the other angels and that Michael works with and under Christ in protecting Israel. Now let's look at the other verses that speak about Michael. Now two of them are in Daniel 10 and the other is in Jude verse 9. Now Daniel 12, sorry, Daniel 10, 13 says that Michael is one of the chief princes. He is not the chief prince, but one of a few chief princes, which would be a strange thing to say about Jesus Christ. Now in Jude 9, Michael doesn't bring an accusation against the devil, but call on the Lord to rebuke him. Now this is in stark contrast to when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness in Matthew 4. Jesus had no such problem with the devil. He personally rebuked him since he is the Lord. Let's now look into one final controversy related to Jesus Christ, and that is the issue of whether Jesus was created or has always existed like God the Father. Now there are three differing views on this question. Now, the first is that Jesus Christ was created and had no existence until he was begotten by the Father in Mary's womb. Now, the next one is that Jesus Christ was created by the Father before anything else was created and we're at the very beginning of time. And the last view is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father, was not created and has existed eternally. Now, let's look at the first one, that Christ was created and did not exist until his begettal in the womb of Mary. Now this particular teaching that Jesus did not come into being until his begettal in Mary's womb is a Christadelphian teaching. Now there are other, one particularly unusual doctrine is their belief, or I should say their non-belief, in the devil as a literal being. Now that said, I do admire the deep passion of those Christadelphians that I personally met in studying the Bible. Now in relation to John 1 verse 1, they point out that the Greek word for word, logos, means thought or word or plan in God's mind. They say that this is not a reference to a being and that spokesman is not a valid way to interpret it here. Now even if Logos purely means a word or thought or plan. This does not negate the word being a literal being, since word could also be used as someone's name. For example, grace can mean something given, and it can also be a, a, a girl's name. Now it also says that the word was with God, not in God, as a thought or plan would be. And verse 14 also clearly states that the word became flesh. Now, how could everything be made that was made through him if he didn't come into existence until 2000 years ago? Now, Jesus himself said in John 3 verse 13 that he came down from heaven. He did start his existence in the womb of Mary. Now Philippians 2 verses 5 to 7 also says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery, meaning a thing to be plundered or grasped for, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Now the Greek here means make empty or abase oneself, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So he started off in the form of God and then emptied himself. Now many theologians will say that Jesus was fully God and fully man, which is kind of a misnomer. Now he has been both fully God and fully man, but not at the same time. Now when he came to, to the earth, he emptied himself 
So while he had the same personality and character, he did not have the powers of God. In John 5, verse 30, he said, I can of my own self do nothing. He relied on the Father's power to do the miracles that he performed. Now Paul further writes about the pre-existence of Jesus Christ in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 4 when he says, And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they, talking about the Israelites who left Egypt under Moses, drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And then he says, And that rock was Christ. So Jesus was the member of the God family that Moses and the Israelites directly interacted with at the time of the Exodus. Now Jesus further confirms his pre-existence in the book of John. In John 8 verses 56 to 58 he said to the Pharisees, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him. Now Jesus said he personally interacted with Abraham and that before Abraham was, I am. Meaning that he was the I am that pre-existed before Abraham and was the I am who spoke to Moses. Now the Pharisees understood exactly what he was saying because they picked up stones and then said, attempted to uh, stone him for blasphemy. Now later, when he was with his disciples at his last Passover, Jesus said, talking to his father, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself. Notice this, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Now, how much plainer does Jesus have to get about his pre-existence than this? He asked his Father to give him back the glory he had together with the Father before the world was created. Now, Jesus Christ was our great creator, and his life, therefore, was worth more than all of mankind's put together. Now, this is how we could pay the price for all of mankind's sins. Now, to deny the pre-existence of Jesus Christ in Old Testament times is to deny Jesus Christ was our creator. If Jesus Christ was not our creator and only first came into being through the supernatural begel of Mary, then how could his life pay for the sins of all mankind? Now, we saw before how Jesus made the point that he was the God being who called himself I Am, who appeared to Moses. Now, in the book of John, Christ used the phrase I Am to describe himself in seven different ways. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life and I am the vine. Now before we look at the question of whether or not Christ was created before and everything else, we need to clarify what we can about what we know about time. Now in a debate about religion and creation, the speaker Kent Hoven said the following regarding God, time and the universe. He says, Time, space, and matter are all what we call a continuum. All of them have to come together at the same instant. If there are no matter, if there were matter but no space, where would you put it? If there was only matter and space, when would you put it? You cannot have time, space, and matter independent of each other. They have to come together simultaneously. And God answers that in 10 words. In the beginning, that's time. God created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. Time, space, and matter created a trinity of trinities. Time has a past, present, and future. Space has length, width, and height. Matter has solid, liquid, and gas. 
You have a trinity of trinities, and the God that created them has to be outside of them. If he's limited by time, he's not God. The God who created the universe is outside this universe. End of quote. Now, I've heard the statement a number of times that God is outside of time. Now, is that true or is that just an assumption? What do we really know about time? Now, all we really know for sure is that time is the sequence of one thing happening after another. We measure time, but what we're doing when we say that is that we've picked a sequence of ongoing events that we perceive is consistent, and we are measuring our own sequence of events against that. For example, the sequence of events we are using as our gauge might be the mechanical movement inside a clock, or the movement of the Earth around the Sun, or the vibrations of an atomic clock. Now, I've been following a branch of science called the Electric Universe, and some of its proponents have argued that there are a number of faulty assumptions in the theory of relativity, including its interpretation of time being relative to the speed in which an object is traveling. Does time really slow down, or is the velocity just affecting our measuring instruments? Now, as noted by Ken Hogan, length, breadth, and height can't exist independent of each other. Length, breadth, and height are properties of matter. Now, likewise, time is a property of anything that exists. Now, if God exists and he does one thing after another, that doing one thing after another is time. So how can he be outside of time? Now, in Titus 1 verse 2, we read, In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. There are two ways of interpreting this, this expression, before time began. Now, the far more likely possibility is that this is just simply a figure of speech. Now, the less likely possibility is that this is a literal, scientifically true statement. Now, since time is essentially the sequence of doing one thing after another, and God is always doing one thing after another, this interpretation would imply that God created physical time and that there is some difference between spiritual time, which existed before he created physical time. Now, the bottom line is, well, we have no way of knowing any of this for sure. So with that as background, let's look into the question of whether or not Christ was created before anything else. Now, there are two verses that directly speak about this question. Now, the first one is in the Old Testament in Micah 5, verse 2. Now, this is the verse that the Jews told Herod about, the location of where the Messiah was to be born. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Epaphra, though you are little amongst the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. And notice this, whose goings forth are from of old. And then he says, from everlasting. Now, the Hebrew word used here for everlasting is olam, which in the vast majority of cases is used in the New Testament, uh, translated as forever, everlasting, or perpetual. Though occasionally it can be translated as old. Now, the other verse is in the New Testament, and it is Hebrews 7 and verse 3. Now, this section speaks about Melchizedek. Now, the Jews believe that Melchizedek, who met Abraham in the Kidron Valley after his defeat of the kings of the east, was Shem. Now, a number of people in the Church of God also hold to this view, or that he was some human other than Jesus Christ. Now, Herbert Armstrong, however, believed that Melchizedek was indeed Jesus Christ. Now, the expression without father, without mother, without genealogy is interpreted by some to mean that he had no priestly genealogy. Now, the expression having neither beginning of days nor end of life is then interpreted by some to mean we have no record of his birth or death. Now, verse 3 clearly states that Melchizedek remains a priest continually or, in other words, forever. Now, this is impossible if he was Shem or some other human being. If he was Shem, then we certainly do have a record of his birth and death, 
and Genesis 11. So, if we assume that Jesus Christ was Melchizedek, then we are told that Christ had no beginning of days nor end of life. He was never created and is eternal. It also states that he was without father in the beginning of time. Now later on earth, he was begotten and became the son of God the Father. Now the view that Christ was created at the beginning of time before the universe was created through him is a teaching referred to as Arianism. After its first major proponent, a bishop named Arius from Alexandria in Egypt who lived around 300 AD. Now as best as I can tell, it appears that those who held this view around this time also believed the Holy Spirit to only be God's power and not a third person of the Trinity. Now this view of Arianism was vehemently and violently opposed by the Catholic Church, though it was supported by prominent Gothic, Vandal and Lombard kings both before and after the fall of Rome. Now let's look at the verses used to promote the opposing view that Jesus was created in the beginning of time. Now Colossians 1, in Colossians 1.15 we read that he, that Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now this is very similar to Revelation 1.5 that says he is the firstborn from the dead. So that can simply refer to Jesus as the firstborn of all those who have been born into God's family. Now Revelation 3 verse 14 refers to Jesus as the beginning of the creation of God. Now the Greek word for beginning here is the word arch, A-R-C-H-E, and it means chief or first, as in the words archangel or arch enemy. Now these two verses have simple alternate interpretations than those used to promote the view that Christ was created. Now that said, there is one other verse that holds more weight as it is more difficult to be interpreted another way. Now this verse is shown here on the right. It's John 5.26 which says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted, past tense, the Son to have life in himself. Now Jesus says this during his ministry before his crucifixion and resurrection. Then he says that the Father had, past tense, granted him to have life in himself. Now the simple natural reading strongly implies being given immortality before he came down in human form. Now of the two commentaries that I have which support the traditional side of the argument, their explanation of this phrase is that Christ has been given the authority by the Father to give and take life as he is the way, the truth and the life and no one has life except by him. Now if he was uncreated, Christ certainly would have had the, that authority to ultimately give or take away life even before his resurrection. So that interpretation can work with this verse even though it's not necessarily the most comfortable fit. Now the two verses on the left support the uncreated point of view and are quite difficult to reinterpret if one believes that Christ was created. The one, that, the one verse on the right can be interpreted in a way that does fit the uncreated point of view. To reinterpret the verses on the left to fit the created point of view would require making a distinction between spiritual time and physical time by having Christ created before physical time was created and that is something we just like I said before, cannot prove at this time. So because of the balance of biblical evidence shown here, our default position has, on this has to be that Jesus Christ was not created and why God the Father is an uncreated being. Now whichever way you want to go to with regards to this view about whether Christ was created or uncreated, you have to deal with one or two difficulties or conundrums. Now the first two problems face our traditional view that Jesus is uncreated. Now one is if Jesus Christ has existed eternally with the Father, why is the Father in authority over Jesus Christ as stated in John 14, 28 and 1 Corinthians 11, 3? Was it just a decision that they made at the beginning of time and why? Now the second is that it's hard for us 
to comprehend that the fact that a perfect, loving, almighty being has always existed, let alone two of them. That God didn't come from anywhere and has always been here is something very hard for us to wrap our minds around. Even harder is believing that there are two of them. Now, very thankfully for us, they both have perfect, righteous character and are not a mixture of good and evil like us or the gods of Greece, for example. Now, those first two conundrums aren't so much of a problem for the unorthodox, creative point of view. Yet, if one believes Jesus was created at the beginning of time, that creates a, a whole new conundrum, and that is, how did Jesus get his perfect, righteous character? If God sort of cloned himself at the beginning of time, and Christ was created by the Father, doesn't that mean that God can create a being with perfect character instantly? Why put us through all the pain and suffering of this life that comes from sin, if he could have instantly created us perfect like Jesus? If that character is not something God can create instantly, did Christ have to develop character over a period of time before it was set for eternity? Now this is quite a conundrum for those who wish to believe in the creative point of view for Jesus. Now our official United Church of God position is that Jesus Christ is not a created being. It's a position I personally support. That said, as we have seen, it is a complicated subject that is not without its difficulties. I really look forward to the time when I can ask Jesus a few questions personally and have some of, some of these things clarified. Now after the father begot him and he was an embryo in the womb of Mary, Jesus genetically had that same God personality that he had as the word along with a full measure of the Holy Spirit as it says in Luke 4, 4 verse 1. One moment he was the all-powerful creator of the universe and in the next moment he became as amazing as it sounds as big as a grain of sand in the womb of Mary. Now let that sink in for a moment. And it would have been truly amazing to hold Jesus as a baby, knowing that this was the one who created all mankind and the world around us. Now Jesus was born, grew, grew up just like we do, faced every general type of temptation that we endure in our lives, lived a sinless life, and then voluntarily, knowing he could back out at any time, allowed himself to be tortured and brutally murdered and suffer the penalty of sin that we have earned through our actions. Our Lord and our God really is an awesome God to do all of that for us. Jesus Christ, though he never sinned, was tempted in all points like we are, as it says in Hebrews 4.15. He knows the pulls of the flesh that push us in the direction of sin and can empathise with the struggles that we have with sin. He is the Son of God. He is our Creator. He is our High Priest our saviour, our friend, our elder brother, and he is the captain of our salvation. So that concludes part one of who and what is God. Now in part two, we'll look into the Holy Spirit and look at what the Bible has to say about whether it is a separate person or consciousness in the Godhead, apart from the Father and Jesus Christ, or is it just the power that proceeds from them? We'll then look at the name of God, whether God has one particular personal name, as argued by some groups, or whether he goes by many names. After that, we'll look into what God looks like. Does he have a particular shape, or is God just an essence that fills the universe? Then we'll explore the character and personality of God. And finally, we'll explore a very bold and plain answer whether man can become God or not. Thank you.